Today's episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Albert Lee Seed. Here at Back to the Roots, it is our goal to create connections with organic farmers across the country. Now we'd like to connect you with a leading provider of organic and non-GMO farm seed and Albert Lee Seed. Cover crops, forages, small grains, corn, and soybeans. Albert Lee Seed is helping organic and transitioning farmers diversify their crop rotations and create healthy herds, healthy soil, and healthy humans. Whether you're looking for organic oats for cover cropping, highly digestible alfalfa, or a 105-day non-GMO corn hybrid, Albert Lee has got you covered. In fact, they were the first farm seed company in the industry to offer guaranteed levels of non-GMO purity in their Viking corn and soybean line. Check out their website at www.alseed.com to see their farm seed lineup or to request a catalog. And thank you to Albert Lee Seed. You're listening to Back to the Roots podcast. And today, Mike Klein and myself are sitting down with Ron Miller, who is the president and general manager of R&G Miller & Sons in uh, Columbus, Wisconsin, which is uh, R&G Miller is a dairy farm, uh, milk about 400 cows, and I won't take too much of the introduction, uh, but thanks a lot, Ron, for sitting down with us, and why don't you kind of go into the background of what you guys are doing here. Sure. Thank you for having me. yeah, we're uh, we've been uh, organic for 22 years now. 1997, we were certified. Um, we farm about 1,600 and so acres, um, all certified. Own about a thousand, rent another 600. Um, farm's been in the family since 1852, so we gener- we definitely are a family family farm. Uh, um, there's uh, six family members. Um, currently working on the farm um eight eight full-time employees and um yeah we're milking like you said um between 360 400 cows just depending on time of year um and we've been with organic valley since uh, we started you know since we were able to ship organically since we were um after the transition so let's go into the transition a little bit. Uh, when you guys, what what triggered you to start looking at organic, and were you grazing at that time? How big were you? Have you grown since that point? Some of those kinds of stuff. Sure. Um, no, we were um, pretty much just a conventional, um, just a conventional dairy farm uh, before we started the transition. We um, we always had you know grazed some heifers and dry cows that type of thing, like most you know. I guess you'd say conventional dairies back then, um, but uh, at the time we uh, it was in nineteen well it was in the late late eighteen nineteen eighties and stuff we uh, um, it was my uh, cousin was then general manager and president and he was kind of looking at that always that um, organic side of things a little bit but my uncle was. Um, kind of against it so we kind of held off on it but then um, towards the end of the 90s there uh, my uncle got uh, colon cancer and um, he had done all the spraying over the years and his family um, children and everything kind of really um, attributed the cancer to um, all the years of him spraying the chemicals on the on a on the farm so um after that and then it was also um uh, kind of a period of some really low prices um one of them down times and uh and and following also the same kind of same time we also that year it was one of those years where you spray and things didn't quite work and then you had to spray again just because of the weather and whatnot and we just kind of got to the point where um, he said, you know, well, this is, you know, we're kind of at the mercy of the chemical companies. You know, they're telling us how to farm, and we're trying to just really relying on them. So he um, kind of brought it up that we should 
um, go organic and we contact or our NFO field man actually kind of brought it up too and and said that well there's this organic co-op that started not too long ago and um, milk price is quite a bit higher and so we said well we might as well check it out and um, so we contacted them and um, Jim Wiedeberg actually was the one that came out and talked to us um, I think somebody else too I can't remember who it was but I know it was Jim and um, we kind of decided to start transitioning and and we did it in 1997 may of 97 we were um, certified organic and we were able to start shipping so was your dairy approximately the same size then or has it grown it's grown um we were probably what size were we um probably that upper 200s around 300 maybe at that time when we when we first started shipping organically Mm -hmm. and then um, we've grown a little bit since then over the years. Was were you gra- Well, you weren't grazing when you transitioned. So, you know, I've seen on a few farms of that have gone organic that went from the total confinement to grazing. Definitely some roadblocks, some hurdles to jump. What was it? Was um, it was definitely a learning curve on all you know aspects of the farm. You know, just, just the cropping. You know, too because and and the grazing part. Uh, and at the time, the grazing, what do you want to call it, the grazing rule or whatever mm-hmm. that they, I don't mm-hmm. remember what year that was passed, but so we started grazing, but there were no real rules until that, you know, we were kind of continually growing as, you know, the number of acres we were grazing, but I can't remember what year that was, but whenever that grazing rule came out, then we had That's to the, really expand. the 30% grazing. dry matter rule. Right. Yep. Okay. Do you know, Brian, do you know what year that was? Mm-mm. That was early. That would have been early two thousands. I was gonna say like two thousand five, maybe. Okay. Um, something like that, um, and that's when we uh, really expanded the, you know, the, our paddocks and everything like that, as far as. No, when yeah. when you graze, do you group the have cows in different groups like the high production, medium production, low production, and then they would graze in separate paddocks? Those three groups. Yep, we actually have four um, oh, separate four groups. milking groups. Um, we call one our post fresh group, um, one our high production group, kind of a another one that's uh, first lactation, not true first lactation. There's some second lactation, younger a younger group, and then. Um, kind of your mid to late lactation group and um and each each group has its own paddock when they go out to graze and they pretty much well we have first i should i guess get into what we have we have like i think it's 32 separate eight acre paddocks around the uh, milking parlor where they go into and minimum of probably probably like four days each group has in each paddock that we we split it off into Mm -hmm. you know Cross fencing, cross fencing, mm-hmm. yeah, in each paddock, and um, so every day they get a fresh, fresh uh, break of grass. Um, so yeah, and then we've also got you know a group out there grazing um, the further out ones where our dry cows are. Um, Pre fresh group stays in two paddocks close to the buildings because they can come in and out as they want to. Um, but like the dry cows and the heifers, heifers they have um, more further away paddocks. We actually have one kind of in a woods further away, and then when that one's that pasture is done, it's kind of in a wooded area. We, it's even hard to cross fence that, so they pretty much just get out there and we just let them graze till that paddock is done, and then we load, bring them back to the buildings on the lanes, and then we have to haul them across the highway to another bigger paddock area you know the pasture mm-hmm. i guess you wouldn't really, really call it a paddock it's pretty big so those we kind of so yeah so it's a lot of a lot of groups out there grazing at one time mm-hmm. that that had to be looked like a huge chore or a task to figure out laying out your pastures and your paddocks and everything for the size of herds you are we did um we actually had um um Brian Pillsbury from the USDA had come out and kind of set up our grazing plan, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I guess it was a grazing plan back when we just first started grazing. And um, that kind of went with that and went from there. So it was, and I believe he's 
either retired now or still with them. I'm not sure, but I seen him a few years ago and talked to him. Do you have any of your pastures irrigated? No irrigation. No irrigation anywhere no. on the farm. No, no irrigation at all. It's kind of neat when we drove up the road and you saw pastures with electric fence, and you you can almost bet, especially now in in our area of Ohio, you have conventional farmers that do intensive grazing, but in most areas when you see electric fence and cross fencing, you think, oh, organic farm. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to see that coming up the yeah, road. Yeah, in this area you don't see that too often. There's um, even well, just dairies are getting thinner and thinner but i guess that's kind of all across the country countryside um but yeah around here the there's not too many organic dairies around oh really not much in this area there's a few but not a whole lot mm-hmm. do you raise most of your own feed we do um pretty much all of it um we do once in a while like this year we're buying some uh, dry hay um, but pretty much all the grain we raise on our own um, the only reason we're buying uh, dry hay this year is just because of the weather last the last half of last year and beginning of this year. Um, just so wet, we weren't able to get enough. It was really hard to make yeah, dry hay this was, year. Yeah, even last year. Mm-hmm. The last uh, couple of crops, well, the last crop of, um, we've got some fields that are set up just for grass that we harvest just for baling for the heifers and whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, we couldn't even make the last cutting of hay because it's all in lower ground. And um, so we didn't get that harvested. The spring was, we didn't get our um, new seeding in last fall. We pretty much do all fall seeding of alfalfa. Um, we couldn't get that in last fall. So this year we're, we had to get our new seeding in. So that didn't, wasn't, we missed the first crop on that. So we're kind of um, behind on forage production mm-hmm. right now we're kind of trying to catch up so we have been buying some uh, dry hay mm-hmm. do you normally uh make some dry hay like you said just for the heifers and dry cows and then you're chopping and bagging every every other crop of hay pretty much yes um like i said we do have uh fields set aside that we pretty much just just bail um unless it's you know gets a little it gets away on us a little bit in first crop then we will chop it and bag that also but then mm-hmm. that still ends up getting fed to the um like the heifer group or something like that in the winter time mm-hmm. so like when you're when you're chopping you know i we're sitting at the office here i don't see a ton of equipment around you know for chopping uh do you custom harvest or do you or do you have equipment around somewhere that we're not seeing oh uh, we do custom harvest um We've had um, that done, I'd say probably eight years, maybe eight, nine years already. We've been doing, uh, having our chopping and combining custom harvested. Um, we tried it um, beginning. We just said, uh, well, we'll try it just because of the cost of the equipment. You know, you got to cover so many acres to justify the expense mm-hmm. of that equipment. And so we'll try it, and oh, we love it. Um, the timeliness, because they come in with their huge equipment that you would never be able to afford, and just because they go over so many acres, and uh, the time, you know, they it, they can cut it so fast, and you're chopping it so fast, and it's all of a sudden you're done. You know, it's the quality is there; it never gets away on you for you know too dry or anything. You can just go you know it's mm-hmm. so they they mow all the hay too yep they mow it they mow it merge it and chop it for you yep yep we have our own bagger um and three wagons um three i guess you'd say um trailers they're the um a bit, bit, bit bigger than the wagons but uh but that is that is a lot of equipment that you don't have to, if you don't do anything on the hay side except a couple wagons because mm-hmm. To do the amount of acres of hay that you have, that takes a lot of tractors and a lot of equipment to get it done. Right. So, you know, in our area, I don't know of anybody that actually, there's a bunch of custom harvesters around, but I don't know of anybody that would do the mowing and the merging as well. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, they come in, they're mower, they've got one of them front mount mowers, mm-hmm. you know, and they just, I mean, they can mow uh like an 80 acre field in two hours you know if, i mean if that i mean they just fly and they just and um 
And then, you know, when it's ready to go, they have self-propelled merger. They come in and merge it up, and the windrows are are just, you know, they're unbelievably large, and uh, the chopper just eats it up. And mm-hmm. so we'll have our three wet, you know, trailers out there. They'll have, um, if it's a little further away field, they'll throw in two more or one more just to me, you know, depending on what we need. And then say we're using one of our tractors, so we're down, you know, one, they just, so it's pretty much works out really well. They'll put in whatever we need that to get mm-hmm. the job done. If we don't, and they're, they're local here. They're pretty local. Yeah. They go everywhere, anywhere from, um, Oh, they probably cover, I'm not sure, like from Sauk city to Lake mills. I mean, it's probably, a almost a 50 mile area that they will cover that okay. they do travel to do. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's, they get around. And they, they do your silage, corn silage too? Correct. Yep. Yep. And you haven't run in, I know you said they come in on time. I know one of the big issues that farmers have run into just that with custom harvesting is, oh, yeah, when I'm ready, they're not. Right. Um, well, for like with hay, um, if you're, you know, there's always got to be somebody that <laughs> has to be first. And there's always somebody that wants, you know, the rocket fuel haylage. And so they're going to be the first ones. And as long as you're willing to put it off and we prefer ours to get, you know, we don't want the rocket fuel. It, that doesn't work so great, you know, with, um, so we, we don't mind waiting a little bit. So we're usually kind of a little bit towards the end, but they're pretty fast. And once, one, you know, our first crop is the only issue because once mm-hmm. that's is set, you know, then the next time around, it's the schedule is, mm-hmm. you know, everything is the same. You know, they do everybody in the same order. And it's especially difficult in a wet year like this to get first cutting done. Right. Because, well, I know in Ohio, the windows that we had were tiny. Mm-hmm. So if you, farmers that missed those windows, were looking at maybe two weeks later. Yeah. You know, if, you know, you had two or three days of nice weather and a lot of hay got mowed, but the ones that uh, didn't quite trust it, yeah, they're behind all year now. Yeah. Well, and this, this spring, um, it was such a late, you know, with it being so much rain and it was cold, um, we weren't able to get the cows out when we wanted to. A lot of times we were able to get the heifers out a lot, you know, at least two weeks earlier than what we did. So we had them still in the yard feeding them, the, you know, the stored feed. So we were running right out and, um, we got to the point where we were pretty much out and we had to go and we just contacted them and, you know, they work with us really well. Um, we've had them, they've been doing it for us the whole time and, mm-hmm. you know, they value the relationship we have and, and it works out good too with them having two choppers cause they can still keep on schedule with their things. And if they need to go to somebody else just for an emergency type thing, they can do that. So when you're looking at, you don't want rocket fuel, uh, do you mean you just don't want the higher protein content just because energy is flat or energy is tougher to come by in organic? Right, right. I mean, you want the, I mean, with the rocket fuel, it, you know, you got to somehow slow it down in the room and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And, and if you get a little more mature, it, it, um, you still have, you know, not real mature, but I mean, I mean, these people are doing it before, you know, as soon as they see a bud, they're out there ready mm-hmm. to go. And we don't mind seeing a couple of blossoms, you know, and that still is good quality, but you're still getting a lot more tonnage that way, better yield, mm-hmm. yield, and you're still getting good quality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what breed of cows are you milking and what kind of production are you getting? Um, we're probably uh, probably 80% Holstein. Um, the rest of the breed, breeds, we have kind of a mix and match. No no official crossbreeding program, but you know we like a little bit of variety. So we've got some, uh, there's some milking shorthorn, Fleck V, Normandy, um, what else? A little bit of... Uh, a f- little bit of jerseys. We try to stay away from them. Those are a little too small for the free stalls, the parlor. Um, we're kind of being that they were set up for Holsteins. You know, everything is that size. So, mm-hmm. but uh, like I said, um, and then there's um, some um, uh, Montbelliard. So we've got a variety of um, different breeds in there. Those just experiments over the yeah, years? Yeah, <laughs> just something that we thought, you know, 
you know, they'd say, oh, this is a good breed. So we thought, well, we'll try a few, you know, and so we'd breed some to them. And so I don't know, we've never, um, we really like the Fleck V's. They're um, no, um, no maintenance, hardly. Mm -hmm. Big, little big, bigger animals, but uh, they, they just never have any problems with them. They tend to milk really well. Uh, longevity is really good on them. Are you getting butter fat out of the fleck feed? Better butter fat than Holsteins, or a little bit, a little bit of the, and some of them, some of them yes, some of them no. Um, I thought it'd be a little bit better on some of them, but when you look at the tests, there's not a whole lot, a lot of difference across the board on mm -hmm. you know where they really stand out. Mm -hmm. So. Well, with the market moving more towards butter fat, have you done anything as far as like just selecting higher, higher component bulls? Yes. For yep. The Holsteins. Yep. Yeah. When we do our bull selection, um, before it used to be more, I don't know, kind of net merit type of thing. Now we're looking more at, well, we've been. I'll start out with uh, in the breeding program. We've been uh, breeding A two A two for yeah. probably ten years. So all the bull, any, you know, we're, we're pretty much all AI for 50 years probably on the farm here, um, except for the virgin heifers, we always run a bull with them. Um, but even those, we test and make sure that they're A282. Um, and now we've really gone to, so the first criteria is they got to be A282. And now we've really been pushing towards the pole since the pole bulls have really gotten more, um, what do you want to say, more closer in, uh, not quality, but more the in trait. line with yeah. um, the, you know, regular mm -hmm. unpolled bulls, you know, mm -hmm. before, just a few years ago, a polled bull was way down on the mm -hmm. depth chart, I guess you'd mm -hmm. say. The <laughs> only thing plus on that was no horns. Right. I mean, yeah, that was kind of it, but they've really come. I think most breeds have come a long way. A now, long way, fast. It was interesting. Uh, you mentioned Mount Billiards. Um, we have one farmer, grass milk farmer, who is breeding everything Mount Billiards for his grass milk herd. Mm. He loves them, but they do not have a pulled bull. Oh, There's wow. no pulled bulls in Mount Billiards, he said. <laughs> now, I don't know, maybe he's not looking at the right place, but he said they hold condition much like Fleck V. Mm. Yeah, they, so, they're very similar, it seems mm -hmm. to be. You know, at Low least maidens. On the cross, yeah. I mean, when you go through the herd now and you see a white-headed cow, it's hard to know if it's a fleck fee or if it's mm -hmm. not billiard. So we're like, oh, it looks like a fleck fee. But then you go and look in the... Look in the records, and it's no, nope, that was a Mont billiard. So it's it's hard mm -hmm. to tell them apart when they're you know on our crossbred animals. Are you are you seeing a difference in with your your crossbreds, do they graze better than the regular Holstein, or is it just the way they were raised? Because I'm guessing it took probably took a couple of generations for your cows to really embrace the grazing aspect. That's true. Um, I think it's more of a uh, pretty much how they're raised and how mm -hmm. they're more. I don't know what do you want to say genetics? Because uh, I really don't see any. I guess the only thing you see more on the crossbreds than the Holsteins is that they do hold their condition better mm. on the, when they're grazing. Um, but otherwise, the Holsteins graze great, mm. you know. But they, in the beginning, they weren't that great of grazers. So I think sure. it just took, like you said, a few well, generations to... It was a brand new thing for not only you, but it was a brand new <laughs> thing to them, too. That's right. That's right. I want to switch gears a little bit and because you raise a lot of row crops. Right. And what is your method of weed control? Do you chisel plow, moldboard plow? How do you, how do you, I kind of like to know from like prep to harvest, what is this? Because weed control is not easy. Right, right. Um, well, the number one thing is crop rotation. Um, and our primary tillage tool now, um, the last several years has been, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, a uh, lemkin. Um, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, um, hybrid disc, but it's, um, it's be it's made for high speed. That's the vertical tillage. Yes. Lemkin. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, um, you can go into sod, uh, and it just turns it over and it just, it looks almost like it's a plowed field. I mean, it's, 
it's a uh, we love it i mean you it's made for going you know 10 miles an hour and you just cruise across the field and you're basically it looks like you've plowed your field mm-hmm. um and it it does a really nice job um so that's our you know our primary tillage tool and then um yeah like i said crop rotation we do that and then um say it's corn we plant the corn well on a normal year you'll work your field like a week before you plant it and let them you know roots or the seeds take off the weed seeds and then you can work it again let that first flush of weeds Mm -hmm. get them worked down so you work it then right before you plant it and about five days after you plant it rotary hoe it before the corn's even up because then you're getting them white root little white root Mm -hmm. weeds out of there and then um basically another five days after that by the time the corn's usually up you rotary hoe it again so pretty much rotary hoeing at least twice and then uh cultivating twice or sometimes it depends on how fast your corn grows Mm -hmm. i mean we'll cultivate it until you can't cultivate anymore pretty much and then um and that's pretty much it for the corn um if in a really wet year this year we didn't have to do it um and you can't get in there to cultivate. We do have a flame cultivator okay. also, a LP. Um, we used to use it every year for the corn, but you do see, a, I don't know how exactly the percentage, but I'd say just my feeling is a probably about a 10% uh, yield hit if you okay. burn it. Because it's just like if you're, I mean, it looks like, you know, your corn froze because it looks like you're like, oh, my God, what did I do to it? Mm-hmm. But then several days later, it's you don't even know it, it happened. You know, it's just right back to. So I mean, it. But it does work. You know, really does help clean up your corn in between the. You know, in between in the row in the row. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we have that back. You know, to fall back on if we can't get in there to cultivate and the weeds get ahead of us. Mm-hmm. And is beans about the same thing? Pretty much. Yep. Um, we rotary hoe them also um and cultivate them um we we do have uh two different cultivators too we just have a little six row um with danish tines in on that we uh, use first when when everything's really small and we go real slow and has the like the rolling shields on it or oh we don't no oh you don't no we we probably could should because then we'd be able to go a little faster but uh, we just go real slow and it does a really nice job but we're able to get in there you know a lot sooner than uh, with our other the other one has the big sweeps on that's a 12 row just like okay. our corn planter and that one we go through when it's a little bigger and that way we can throw the dirt up into the row a little bit and mm-hmm. cover up the weeds in between the corn and beans too but um, not so much the beans but um, but yeah it's pretty much the same corn and beans um, rotary hoe and cultivate there's two farmers now actually well scott stoller and scott myers both have the weed zapper Okay. Um, yep. For the Heard beans, I I actually rode last week. Warren Stoller was doing some in my neighborhood, so I just went out and rode with him. And fifteen thousand volts of electricity on the front three point, just zapping anything that stuck up through the weeds. And giant ragweed does not appreciate fifteen thousand volts. Oh, really? It because within within ragweed. three minutes, that head is drooping and it's getting limp. Nice. <laughs> um, just the head or the whole the whole thing will die really? mm-hmm. on giant ragweed mm-hmm. nice that's so. pretty much the biggest issue i mean grass can be somewhat of an issue at times but it st- doesn't really i mean over the years we've you know been able to control that but it's the giant ragweed that just on corn and beans that'll just mm-hmm. smother smother stuff out mm-hmm. And we we've um, last year and this year now we've had a a group of people. Um, it's kind of a fundraiser for them. Um, I think it's some church in some prairie that um, has come out and a bunch of people have come and pulled weeds in our soybeans, oh. um, hmm. and we pay them by the acre and um, it's worked out pretty well. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's basically the giant ragweed they're, they're pulling. Mm-hmm. But it would be, I've seen the zapper and it's something that it, um definitely would be interested in trying out because mm-hmm. that's that giant ragweed is nasty yeah i i guess my only concern is 
do we know what that's doing to, is it killing any soil life? Because any weed that it hits is dead. I mean, there's fields, you know, four or five days later, it looked like it was roundup. Wow. Like it, it works. Yeah. But, you know, I guess I just wonder, is that electricity dissipated enough when it hits the soil to not do anything? I don't know. To the mm. soil, the soil life. Yeah. Yeah. So. But I don't know. It's it's, good, it's another tool, product, I guess. Yeah. Project for somebody. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> One thing we can get into, um, you got, uh, you built a, a brand new calf facility the last time we were here, which would have been a couple of years ago, a few years before that. Um, so you're raising all your calves on farm. Yep. And, yes. um, you know, what, what did you build and what was the reasoning behind it? Yeah. Um, yeah, we've always raised all of our own replacements. Um, we, uh. Originally, we had our calves, our, I guess you'd say our calf barn was in a old, um, basically a dairy barn, a stanchion dairy barn that we had retrofitted into pens for calves. Um, but in 2012, um, that burnt down. Um, so we had to scramble and uh, we built a new, new calf barn, um, kind of uh, well, pretty much um, mirroring the barn that we lost because we really liked that um, so there's a pen with um, group housing calves um, we have three calves in each pen on the smaller ones um, and we use the milk bar feeders so they all get uh, you know the three calves get fed um, at the same time and then once they shortly before weaning they go move down to the end of the barn where we have six in a pen and we use the milk bar there too until they're weaned and uh but yeah, it's uh, but it's a, a barn with uh, curtain sidewalls. So in the summertime, the curtains can be open. The calves, it's just like they're outside. You get really nice ventilation. Um, put them up in the winter time, seal it up somewhat, not real tight. But uh, and we have a um, outdoor wood burning furnace that we heat it with. Keep it. Try to keep it around 50 degrees. Um, as long as it isn't below zero outside, we can do that. Otherwise, it gets a little chilly in there. Um, but, uh, but otherwise it, it, um, it has a, uh, we, so pretty much we have to clean each pen by hand. So there's no, um, going in there with a the skid steer or anything to clean it out. It's all, we have a barn cleaner in just like a older stanchion <laughs> barn. We just scrape each pen into the barn cleaner mm. and, um, but yeah, it, uh, works out really well uh, we were pretty happy with it what age do you wean at uh, about four months okay and when you're switching i you know i know the i like the group raising but the number one concern i've heard from farmers is that they get sucking right what have you done to how much milk are you feeding is that something that's helped with sucking problems or do you deal with that and what have you done we've uh we feed actually feed um we feed three times a day our calves um, and the amount pretty much varies on the age, the calf, the older they get, we give them a little more. Um, but as far as the sucking goes, um, I'm not sure if, I guess if it might help a little bit feeding them three times a day, but we still do end up with, uh, older heifers that, um, we end up putting like the, the nose, um, I can't remember what you call them. The weaning ring, the, weaning the ring. plastic. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. That we put them into their nose on a few occasions when we catch them doing it, mm-hmm. um, and we've have had a heifer or two that have come in that with a dead, you know, uh, blind quarter that, you know, obviously probably was from being sucked on. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing that was really interesting in Norway. However many I think it was either Denway or Denmark or Norway. However many calves were in that pen. There had to be that amount of suckling teats in the pen for the calves to suck on. So that's a standard that they have. Doesn't have to be water. Doesn't have to. It's just something said because what happens is they'll start there and, oh, well, there's nothing there. So I didn't see a weaning ring. So I don't know if that helps or not, but Mm -hmm. it was something that I had never even thought of until I was over there. Very interesting. 
Now, going to the dairy herd, do you have a, a rotary parlor? Yes, yeah, that was built Can in. you explain that a little bit? Yeah, that? that's a 30-stall rotary. Um, we built that in 1990. Um, it's actually a, a rotoflow. Um, the idea comes from New Zealand, um, so it floats on water. Uh, there's between thirteen and 15,000 gallons of water that this giant bowl of cement... <laughs> Cement bowl is floating, you know, it's like a cement bowl floating inside of another cement bowl. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, it takes, it only takes a little half horse motor to turn it, to turn it. And it's just a little half horse motor on the end of a little platform. This, the weight of the motor pushes down on a trailer tire. And that's what, and that trailer tire is against the, the cement wall. And that's what makes it go back and forth. And just like I said, half horse motor and it variable speed, forward, reverse, whatever you want to do with it. Half horse motor yep. on a, you said 34 stall? 30 stall. 30 stall concrete bowl. Yep. Yeah. And we've had it where the motor is, um, you know, every few years your motor goes to heck, you know, on it. So we've, uh, when that happens, um, you can just lift it up, brace that up so the tires away from the, the cement you know the parlor and then you can just push it by hand even (laughs) so as we're it's kind of a pain in the butt but (laughs) um when they're while they're milking but you know it's usually just to finish milking and we replace the motor but uh yeah it can be pushed by hand no kidding yeah and so when a cow comes on the parlor She's then prepped and the milk are put on. Yep. We and have, then by the time she comes all the way around, she's done and ready to go off. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It pretty much, you know, we can start and stop it whenever we need to, but it's a pretty much it's c- continuously going fairly slow. It takes, um, if everything's going, you know, perfect, um, it's about eight to 10 minutes per revolution. So cow comes on, um, we got two people over there prepping and putting on. So the first person will dip. Dip and strip, and then um, dip, strip, and re-dip. And then the next guy will wipe and put the milkers on. And then we also have a guy on the other side of the, other side of the parlor that um, is post-dipping, checking and post-dipping. And um, so we pretty much have um, three people in the parlor, but that third person also goes and gets the group. So you can say two and a half, I guess. Um, so how long does it take you to milk the 360 cows or whatever? About three hours, a little over three hours. That's moving cows through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's nice. It it's it's uh, just like milking in a parallel parlor. So you're milking between the hind mm-hmm. legs, and uh, yeah, it's it's we're really happy with it. Mm-hmm. So that would be about two cows a minute. That the way. It- I was figuring 120 right. cows an hour, so yeah, two cows a minute. Yep. Yeah, that's I've I've only ever seen one rotary work, hmm. uh, and that was not floating on. Right. Because they said if the motor goes out, they have problems. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of neat that you can just grab a hold and still <laughs> move it around to finish milking. Yeah, that is nice. Um, yeah, it was kind of funny when we built the parlor. We were looking to. Before we, this parlor, we had a double six herringbone that was built in 1969. And by 19, you know, I so said it was only 20 years old when we replaced it, a little over 20, you know, 21 years old when we replaced it in 1990. But that parlor was shot. I mean, it was in really bad shape. And um, so we were looking at different parlors, and uh, we liked the rotary one. But at that time, this was the only rotary parlor out there, the rotor flow. And uh, we really liked it, and we, but we were looking at other parlors too. And when we decided to go with the, the rotor flow, um, a couple of other companies, you know, we looked at the, you know, the ba- main ones, you know, De Lavelle and Surge and whoever else was out there, Bomatic. And I don't remember which company it was, but the guy was like, oh, you're going to... We told him, you know, we made our decision. We're going to go with the rotary. He was like, "Oh, you're going to hate it. You guys are making the wrong decision, and it's you're going to have problems." And it was like no more than a year, two years later, that all the major companies had rotary parlors. So it was like, 
okay. <laughs> what happened there? Do they do they still make the roto flow with floating on water? They do, but it, I don't believe it's marketed in the United States. Okay. They still have it in New Zealand and maybe Europe, but for some reason they've been having issues with getting a distributor over here. Even when we built ours, I think we we're just about done with the building and they switch distributors or something over here then and it seems like every couple of years they were but so i guess i don't know what why but um it, right now it's i believe it's not being marketed mm -hmm. over here if if you build another one would you try to go with the same concept <sighs> we'd definitely go rotary mm -hmm. um would it be a rotary rotor flow i don't know i haven't really looked at close at the other rotary ones but like you said the one nice thing with the one on water you can mm -hmm. you know if it's full of cows you're not stuck if all of a sudden mm -hmm. you know because i know the other ones have bearings and rollers and something when on those go out yeah you're kind of stuck but at least this one you can still push and get it done roto flow i just found my next youtube search <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because your water, if your water is low, you just add water. You don't have to change a bearing underneath there. No, it, it's um, all it has is um, some um, guide wheels in a certain, in a f like three or four different guide wheels so it doesn't bang against mm -hmm. the sides to keep it, you know, and f rolling nice. And and then uh, the the water, we have a, there's a float on it because we do wash down the parlor um, with that water that's underneath mm. there. Um, just so it doesn't get stagnant and mm -hmm. nasty. Um, and then there's a gland down there where the dirty water flows through it. It doesn't get mixed in with the the clean water that's under there. Mm -hmm. So they say every, with what we're cleaning, washing down with, there's sort of like every 10 days you're replacing all the water that's in mm -hmm. there. And so there's a, like I said, there's a gland on the bottom just for the, um, the water, you know, the wastewater to go through and not get mixed with that, and then mm -hmm. the same kind of thing on top, the gland where the milk, the vacuum, the electricity goes through because when it's spinning, it's all got to still mm -hmm. stay in because <laughs> the milk goes up through the, the middle and goes out, and mm -hmm. so your vacuum does too. So it's uh, some kind of a gland, just you know, similar to like a silo loader type of thing. Mm -hmm. well, that's that's intriguing. You know, who would have ever thought? I I honestly had no idea there was a parlor that floats, parlor that floats on water. <laughs> yeah, we've had it since 1990, and there's actually one only mm -hmm. about 10 miles from here that's older than that. Oh, really? <laughs> um, except that one is a little different. They we we stand on the outside of the ring and milk them. They actually are on the inside milking. So the cow when they come on, they got to kind of turn. Okay. Somehow, I don't know, I've never actually seen it in action, but it's a little bit, um, when we, we were looking at them, we decided this would be a lot easier just for them to walk straight in, and then mm -hmm. they just got to back straight out. Mm -hmm. and is it is it hard to train a heifer to go on there? No. Um, a few, once in a while, they'll, you know, a cow will walk on, and a heifer will just kind of walk on behind them, and and you kind of just jump up there and you see her and make sure she gets into her little stall. But And other times you do have to go out into the holding area and get her in, but it's usually the first time, and then after that they just follow the other cows in. Mm -hmm. And so it's training them is real easy. Do you ever run the heifers through before they freshen? No. No? No. I know that's with, with the small guys with like a swing six – where, you know, there's just a bunch of cows in there. There's no dividers or anything. They'll try to, like, run the heifers through for maybe a week before she freshens between two older cows that don't <laughs> let her move. Sure. Yeah. No, we, um, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty much a non-issue, you know, with doing mm -hmm. it. So we we prefer just, uh, you know, it'd be a little, it'd be more stress on them to try sure. to do it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, us too. Mm-hmm. What is your production? Uh, we're right about a right around about a twenty thousand pound herd average. Okay. Mm, what is your fat run then? Uh, right now we're at three eight, three nine. But you know, okay. it seems like in the winter months we're up around four. Mm -hmm. We're pretty much consistently around four, and the protein did, around three two. 
Did you see your fat lower this year than other years because of all the rain on the pastures? Well, yeah, once they got on a pasture, yeah, it it, it dropped. Mm-hmm. Um, but not not really any more than what they would normally okay. drop. Because mm-hmm. we saw a lot of, especially actually colored herds, Jersey herds, that had a lower fat this year on pasture than I've ever seen. Hmm. So I don't know. Our, our climate, like where we are in Ohio, if you go an hour north or an hour south, Completely different ball game. We had really we had decent weather, but a lot of lack of sunshine and a lot of moisture. So the pasture just the grass was nothing but water. Just went straight through the cows, and it really really hurt our solids. Yeah. No, no it seems like um, it wasn't much different than other years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it always seems to drop as soon as they go out on pasture, sure. but. Mm-hmm. Uh, one other thing to get into before we get out of your hair would be uh, the business structure, like how you've got it set up with six family members being involved and then the full-time employees. But as far as like the you're incorporated and have a board of people that are making decisions or how, do, how, how does that exactly work? Yes, we um, – um, so it all started out um, – my my dad and uncle um, bought the farm from their dad, and so they were farming as a partnership. And then in 1978, they incorporated so that it was easy for the kids to get in and involved in the farm. And so that's how we became incorporated. And But, yeah, we have um, – uh, and then there's so many shares each that my dad and my uncle got, and then they divided them up kind of amongst the kids and so it's it's um everybody's got different amount of shares um but we have a board um we meet monthly or at least every six weeks and um yeah any major decisions um are you know board decisions and um but yeah it's it's worked out well over the years Mm-hmm. So what would be considered a major decision? You don't have to get into too many details, but it's like buying a new tractor, a big decision, or are we talking like uh, upping the herd size? To um, No, I guess, um, well, as general manager, any I can bring up anything to get board input, but um, pretty much any kind of uh, real estate or transactions or anything really big you know if it's a tractor that needs replacing that's pretty much you know my decision um there's probably certain things that i'll still bring up to the board just you know to get their opinions on stuff like that input but it's pretty much just a major you know any you know shift in you know the business type thing or anything like that Mm -hmm. or any kind of real estate or any you know major major money purchases you know type of thing um, that the board has to okay. Mm-hmm. How many board members are there? There are, I believe, eight. Eight board members. Now, are they shareholders? Um, most of them are, but they don't okay. need to be. Okay. Um, yeah, over the years, we've had several several board members that were not shareholders, mm-hmm. but majority, of, you know, of the board is are shareholders. Now, is is there an opportunity for the next generation to come in as well? Uh, we are working on a, like a transition um, mm-hmm. thing, but right now the, um, the next generation is kind of limited um, as far as the ones that are interested in actually farming. So it's mm-hmm. it's been a little difficult, but we're continually trying to work on a transition plan. That's one thing that I think isn't looked at enough. And we talked with Pete Lehman about a succession plan. Um, succession plans are not as easy as, well, now it's the next generation's turn. It's especially an operation like you have here. Yeah, I think takes that, a considerable amount of planning. Yeah, and I think that the size of us really hinders, you know, you know, anybody that is trying to, you know, um, I don't know, be, you know, take it over type of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 been a 
it's been a uh, it's taking longer than what we expected it to mm -hmm. type of thing a succession now, plan are, are you looking at expanding your land base as far as are you trying to purchase more land or are you planning on growing the herd size or are you kind of at the size where you're comfortable we're pretty much at the size where we're comfortable um we're at least we're you know we're we're situated the milking setup and everything and for where the cows have to walk to graze you know the milking herd anyway they're pretty much walking as far as we can you know realistically realistically expect them to mm -hmm. um so it's and housing wise too like for the winter time we're at the size you know the buildings and everything to where it, you know 400 is pretty much max for mm us um so yeah and as far as land goes um we're pretty much set on the number of acres but we have you know like this last year we did buy um a few a farm that we had rented for like 30 years um so we're kind of concentrating on more the land close to us that we've rented for years and years that you know could possibly be coming up for sale we're kind of you know concentrating on that type of mm -hmm. thing to where we don't lose it because it's is so close to us that type of thing so we're mm -hmm. really not looking to expand the size but just more you know maybe buy not, some of the land you've been renting right. mm -hmm. yeah yeah well ron i think we'll wrap it up there i appreciate you taking time to sit down with us and share some of the information and stuff you've learned over the years so yeah ron. thank you for having me yep thanks a lot yep.